So, uh, thank you. I'm Jim Millis. Um, I'm from I'm from south of the border here. I'm Connie Crosby and I uh, promoted this event, and we've done other things like that. I've been doing that podcast for about a year and a half. But what I want to talk about this afternoon is the other one that, that, that I do, which I think, this, check this out, is basically for fun. I mean, it's, it's related to my work. I want to educate librarians about technology and law, lawyers and law professors about what librarians do. But one of the big reasons I started that podcast was that I wanted to introduce my faculty colleagues at the law school to the idea of podcasting. And we've been, we've been able this semester to start uh, what I think is potentially actually an important podcast. Um, so that's what I want to talk about this afternoon. University of Buffalo Law School, that's where I work. Um, and you see, we've, we've even got a little link on the front of our our home page to the podcast series. So I want to talk about what, what we're doing. And the title, I couldn't come up with a catchy way of phrasing what I wanted to talk about today. The title of this session is uh, Grassroots Academic Podcasting. And I guess one way of looking at that, that sounds like an oxymoron. What does the academy have to do with grassroots, net roots, whatever, you, however you want to uh, define that? And that's the issue. That's what we, we're trying to do, what we're trying to bridge that gap with this podcast series. Um, a lot of law schools, in the U.S. anyway, are starting to podcast various events. Um, a lot of them are sort of ready-made content. Either, well, certainly classes, podcasting class lectures is one thing, but I'm not really going to address that. Um, a lot of law schools have various kinds of special events. Uh, guest lecturers that come in, uh, scholars, judges, uh, practicing attorneys, and so on, that give a lecture. And um, students being what they are, if you're lucky, you can get 20 students to show up for this event where you've got someone to fly in across the country to, to do it. And you record it, and then they put those sessions up as a podcast. Some of those are really terribly dull. Uh, not all law professors or judges are excellent orators. Um, I listened to one, which actually, once I got to the lecture, it was by uh, uh, John Sexton, who is now the president of NYU and was formerly dean of NYU School of Law. Gave an excellent program about so, sort of the social responsibility of law schools and of universities. But you had to sit through, this was an alumni dinner event. So you have to sit through 20, 30 minutes of introductions and thank you to our wonderful dean for this wonderful event and our wonderful faculty and our wonderful students and thank you to our wonderful alumni and our wonderful donors. And you get through that and finally get to the meat of the lecture, which was actually very, very good. Um, and all, but a lot of the content the law schools are doing is like that. And I guess it, it creates a presence for them. They can say that they're doing a podcast, but I don't know who's listening to them. I subscribe to all of them. I rarely didn't hear them. What we wanted to do, and what we're doing, I think, is unique in the way we're doing it. We do, um, we're, we call the series UB Law Faculty Conversations. Okay? And we do the same sort of, we take advantage of the same sorts of opportunities when we have guest speakers, guest lecturers, or our own faculty who are doing faculty workshops to present you know, a, a work in progress, a paper that they're working on. And we're, I'm fortunate to work at a law school that has a very strong public interest focus. Uh, and that goes back generations in the, in the history of the University of Buffalo School of Law. Um, if anyone is, is, is in the academy or if you're familiar with uh, the law and sociology movement, that's very strong at Buffalo. And it's very much focused on the relation between law and society. It's not, it not just um, what kind of regulations can you, can you create but how does 
law interact with the society, how does society influence law, and things like that. And so it's a very broad and sort of deep way of looking at society and at cultural change and things like that. And a lot, so a lot of our faculty are very deeply involved in this. And what we do is, <clears throat> law schools, a lot of law schools now are, are making their scholarship, the journal articles that the law professors publish, much more widely available than they used to be. They've always been published in law school journals. And if you've ever read a law school journal article, they tend to be 80 to 100 pages long with 800 footnotes. And, and literally, I mean, that's, I'm not exaggerating that. That's true. And uh, because lawyers, at least in the US, like to footnote everything. You, don't, you can't say the sun rises in the east without documenting it. Um, so the thing is, from my perspective, there's a lot of important work, a lot of sort of think tank work that goes on in those articles, but it's buried in a ton of footnotes. And it's very hard to get that knowledge, that information, those ideas out to where they can maybe make a difference. Um, most law journal articles, like most scholarship in the university, is written for a very small group of people, most of whom probably know each other. You know, you're writing an article and that you know your 10 colleagues across the world will read, and then we'll write persnickety comments back to you about it. But, but schools are starting now to make this scholarship available in via open access publishing, which means there are a couple of websites, ssrn.com, bpress.com, that are, that are encouraging faculty to upload their articles either as a draft or as the final published article, so anyone can download it for free anywhere in the world. And that makes a huge stride forward, but still, you still have to read the 100 pages and the 800 footnotes to get the content. So what we're doing with the conversation series is, um, and we've done six of them, five of them this semester, and so and just in the last few weeks, and we've got two, at least two more scheduled next week. It's really starting to take off now, partly because I've been doing my own podcast for a year and a half, and the faculty have seen, they're familiar with the idea. I don't have to explain, have you ever heard of a podcast? They've at least heard of a podcast now. So what we do is, for instance, our last one, uh, Thursday, no, it was Friday, actually before, just before I drove up here, we had a lecture from um, uh, Columbia Law School, Columbia University, talking about her work on workplace equity, primarily uh, racism and sexism in higher education. Very good article with lots of empirical scholarship to it. But what we did is we had a discussion between Professor Susan Sturm, who was our visiting lecturer, and Susan Mangold, who's one of our professors, they know each other. We set them down at a table like this with this little digital recorder and uh, just recorded a conversation. Just one, one colleague to another talked about how did you get interested in this idea? What, is, what does it mean? Things like that that are much more accessible. And then we, hit, we have on the web page, on the blog page, the link to the article itself so that people can listen to a half hour precy of the ideas, the important ideas that are being discussed. And then, if they want to, they can go on to read the article. Other, other conversations we've done, um, they're very wide ranging. Law schools tend to be very wide ranging in their subject areas. Sustainable forestry in Russia. We have a professor who does environmental law and it, one of his big areas of interest is sustainable forestry, and I'm sure that's an, an issue in Canada, right? Um, Maria, and I, I, I'm not sure if I can pronounce it still, Tisachnyuk is from Russia, she's a law professor, or, no, or a law scholar. She gave a, a paper here, and one of our professors, again, sat down with her, talked about the ideas, sort of got her to slow down so you could sort of penetrate her Russian accent a little bit. And, and talk about the ideas and how they, how they relate, how, for instance, environmentalism, this was an interesting one to me, that people tend to assume, at least in the West, that you didn't have environmentalism in Russia until the, the Iron Curtain came down and the West came in and taught them how to do it. That's not true. It turns out not to be true. And there, the environmental movement in Russia is very deeply rooted and very different 
than what we have here in the West. Um, Twala Peria, a visiting professor from Rutgers, about two very, what seem to be very different topics, but when you look at them sort of analytically become closely parallel, transracial adoption, and particularly international adoptions. Uh, someone goes to China, uh, uh, Cambodia, whatever, adopt a child. And the idea of gentrification, people moving in to a maybe historically black community and forcing the residents out as you bring, as you redevelop the property. It's all about uh, cultural appropriation, uh, cultural identity, things like that. And again, it's a very, it's a very dense scholarly article that in a conversation, um, I think brought up the ideas in a very forceful way. So that's what we're trying to do. What we generally do is, um, as I said, we sit down and have a conversation, usually over dinner. That's the way I like to do it, because, our, as I said, my faculty have at least heard of a podcast. They probably haven't listened to one. So I have to explain a little bit, and I want to make it as comfortable and unintimidating as possible. So it usually helps to have a little wine or something like that. So we, we have, I, we sort of developed a roster of quiet restaurants that we can go to where uh, we can get a, uh, maybe a room off to the side, sit down at a table with a couple of faculty and this little recorder, have dinner, have a glass of wine, and then over coffee and dessert, we just segue into the conversation. And we record that. I take it home, do a little bit of editing, add a music and an intro and things like that, and, and we post it. Um, that conversation on, that was uh, with Susan Sturm, had the conversation Friday, right after lunch. I had it posted before I drove up from Buffalo, late, late that afternoon. So, um, and we have a heavy, busy schedule of events like this. We have um, a closely affiliated with the law school, it's something called the Baldy Center for Law and Social Policy, which has lots and lots of faculty across the university, about half of them are law school faculty, half of them are sociologists, anthropologists, um, humanities, historians, whatever you, whatever you have, that work together on interdisciplinary research of various kinds. And some of the sort of projects that go on there, children, families, and the law, again, looking at, at, with, at legal, sociological, in the social work, all those disciplines coming together. Class Crits is a new group looking at questions of law and economic inequality. Uh, environmental stewardship, gender, law, and social policy, international comparative law. Uh, one that we started and which also leads into this project itself, something we're calling Projecting Law, the Law and New Media uh, Research Group, which consists at this point of me and my colleague, um, I think I lost that page, but um, Terry Miller, who's a law professor who teaches a course every year on documentary filmmaking for lawyers, for law students. And um, they've done some excellent work. She has a co-teacher who is a media studies professor. And they teach students to, to do digital video editing, scripting the whole thing, and they do, they produce very good 15 to 20 minute documentaries on whatever is the theme of that year. Last year the theme was the intersection between criminal law and immigration law in the U.S. And if you follow any of that at all, you know that, that um, one, of the, one of the very compelling stories we had was a, a, an immigrant from Jamaica had been in the U.S. for 30 years, had a family here in, in Buffalo. Um, turned out he had a uh, marijuana conviction 25 years ago. He's being deported. Um, or at least that he's in the, he's, the process is going on. And I don't know, we don't know yet what the final result will be. Um, so they do, a vid, they do a video, they do interviews. Very impressive documentary work with a short video of interviewing this person. This year the project has to do with um, uh, domestic violence and women in prisons. 
because the statistics show that, that something like 80% of the women in prison have been victims of domestic violence. And they've worked and they have access now to Attica prison in Western New York, and they're going to actually be able to go in and interview people and, and make these documentaries. And once they're digital, you can do anything you want with them. You can distribute them in all kinds of ways. So, to me, what we're trying to do is sort of, as I said at the beginning, bridge the gap between the, the universities, higher education, where there's lots of sort of theoretical work going on, and sort of bring that to the grassroots community, the activist community, um, things like that. And we're also trying to build ties, because that's the only way you can do this work. You can't go in and film in prisons unless you've built connections, strong connections with the, you know, the, the prison you know, advocates and things like that. So that's what we're doing, and that I think is unique in law schools, and I think has the potential of really being an important way of bringing um, sort of the work that goes on, again, sort of viewing the University of Buffalo as a think tank which can produce ideas and policies which can then work their way into the, the activist and the, 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 the real world community. Hmm. And that's what we're doing, and I'm, and I'm eager to hear what other people are doing and, and any questions you have and suggestions for what we can be doing. Yes? I have a question. Um, you said that you have the podcast and you provide like a, a, a practice summary mm -hmm. and then the full details are there online for people. Right. Do I understand correctly that you actually transcribe the podcast? No. What we do is, um, since most of these, the, uh, the opportunity comes up when a professor comes in and they're giving a presentation on a paper they've written. The paper is published on a website somewhere else. Um, I make it, you know, I've, I've, I've listened to Julian Smith talk about, uh, about uh, connecting with the community and making your, your, your podcast content available. So I want it to be Googleable. We add um, keywords so that, so that it's searchable. We add um, a little abstract and description of the professor. So if someone, and I can look at the logs and see that this happening. Someone searches on forestry and this is going to show up. or, or um, uh, you know, equity in higher education, and, you know, and, and the, these podcasts are showing up. So they are fine. Yes? Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious, um, like the, the idea of a wine and dinner is a good uh, encouraging to get uh, professors out to chat. Do you have any other um, uh, suggestions as far as uh, uh, enticements to uh, get them to start talking and conversing? Topics. Well, um, it helps if, if they know each other. And fortunately, law professors tend to be fairly well connected, to, at least with their colleagues who are doing similar work in other places. They know each other already. They've probably done conferences together and things like that, maybe even written articles together. So they know each other, and that helps. That goes a long way towards it. Part of it, and again, spending a year and a half doing my own little podcast and sending notices to the, the law faculty listserv that saying, here's my podcast. You can go listen. They're aware of it. And now, all of a sudden, they're coming to me saying, I, I want to do a podcast. I have a friend coming in, a, 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 another scholar. We want to do a podcast. So it's, it's taken off. Uh, I guess not a question, just a comment more. Um, I think it's fantastic what you've done. This is uh, all the talk of monetizing the podcast. It's nice to see that yeah, this really kind well. of stuff is going on. Um, I've been listening to podcasts for a long time. and. Uh, UC Berkeley puts up uh, a whole ton of courses, uh, and so I, I listened to a number of those, and I found that the format wasn't very good, and I thought, gee, people should be doing exactly what you're doing. So mm -hmm. a, yeah. a, uh, Podcasting thing. courses is a whole different thing, yeah. and you know it relates to distance learning, and also relates to, um, in some cases, if you have an innovative law course. <coughs> It may be useful to podcast that so that all the people can learn how you're teaching that subject. I have a, uh, my dean is going to be teaching a course on um, cultural property, you know, uh, you know, Native American, you know, the Elgin marbles, all kinds of things like that. And it's it's a hot area, not a lot of courses in. So I, I want I'm encouraging him to podcast that course. But you're right, that, that's a very different kind of thing, and it's not really usually meant for an outside audience. 
Yes. I had a question. What was your planning and strategy before actually doing the podcast? Or did it just seem like a good idea to launch in and then it kind of moved in there? Well, um, I had two reasons for doing getting started in podcasting. One was I looked like a farm. And um, and I've also I've always sort of as a, as a librarian I've always been sort of involved in technology and computer med mediated communication. And so when I became aware of podcasting, I thought this is something I wanted to do. Um, but even like I said from the very beginning, even when I started my podcast, check this out. I was I really was a big part of my goal was to get my faculty, my faculty colleagues, aware of this because this is what I. Like I said, this is what I thought was going to be important, um, that it could really have an impact. So it was a, a sort of a long-term, you know, like you know, playing a chess game several moves ahead that I, I was trying to do. And uh, yes, um, yeah, go ahead. Um, another question I have is uh, when you actually do the recording, mm -hmm. do, you, uh, is it, do you feel you have an obligation to familiarize yourself totally with what these uh, various lawyers, what they're, what they're going to be talking about, what their background is, what the No, is. I don't, which is why I like to have another faculty member do the interview. I see. And, and that's one thing I had to convince them of somewhat, is that they would say, oh, you should do an interview with so-and-so, but I say, I don't know enough about the topic. Why don't you do the interview, and I'll just do the recording, and I'll be a, a nice, receptive audience, and I'll nod, and things like that. Um, but let them actually do the discussion. And then they can see also, if, if I look puzzled, that maybe gives them a clue that well, maybe they need to explain something. Yeah. Okay, yes. Um, I'm wondering, have you set goals for yourself or success indicators in terms of, of this whole series? In we don't do that in number of <laughs> 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 um, Go Well, no. I mean, um, it's you know, we all know it's hard to get statistics and really get a measurement of, of, of who's listening to your podcast. I, I do look at the statistics and I can see where people are linking from. And I've seen that I'm getting lots of links uh, for a, a, a really very new project. I did a couple of recordings last year, but it's really this semester that it's really taken off. And what we do is, uh, when I issue a new podcast, I don't rely just on the RSS feed. I send out messages to listservs. There's a law professor's listserv, and then those messages get forwarded to, say, the uh, domestic uh, relation or you know the family law listserv or the environmental law listserv and then it gets gets heard that way. Yes. Uh, a question, sure. Uh, sure. Um, when you're doing the actual recording, uh, you you're playing more of a tech guy, you know, right. doing the actual recording. And what kind of coaching do you give the uh, uh, give the professors in terms of like uh, speaking? Like I'm sure they're used to speaking. Mm -hmm. To a lecture hall, and so what do you what do you tell them? Do you, just, do you just say, you know, relax and pretend this isn't being recorded? Or? I, I I I use I'm happy, I'm happy to be uh, to intercede more and and tell them, okay, don't sit back like you're in your living room. You have to sort of sit close up, you know, to the microphone, and don't you know, and then they'll forget and they'll start leaning back again. And, and so I'll sometimes sometimes I'm have to say, can you lean in again and say that again? How about interview chat. skills? Have you worked with them to develop interview skills? Uh, the ones that I've worked with have actually, I think, done a very good job. I mean, lawyers learn to interview clients. I think they tend to be fairly good at, at talking to someone and eliciting information. Yes? Sure. Uh, any issues about, like, do they... Uh, Having their material or having their conversations out there, being lawyers, you know, are they concerned about copyright or having this, uh, you know, or is that what they want to have happen? They'd like to see it get distributed. Lawyers, law professors don't make money from publishing, you know. Um, no, they so they, they do want to get their information out there. Um, I guess the one, and actually this comes up with in relation to law class course podcasting, is that. You know, law professors often also uh, think very highly of themselves. And sometimes they're concerned, well, suppose I say something as a hypothetical in class, and then 10 years from now, when I'm being uh, confirmed for the Supreme Court, they bring that, that comment out there. So that's, that's one reason why there's some reluctance to do law, uh, course podcasting publicly that way. But um, so that, that tends to be more of what they're going to be worried about than about someone stealing ideas. They want to get their ideas cited. That's, that's sort of why they're publishing them. 
aside from uh, sorry, yeah. aside from having the, this, you seem to be making this very valuable connection between the, the academy and yeah. the outside world. Mm -hmm. um, does this also uh, uh, have potential as being a vehicle to get students interested in specific courses or topics? Oh, absolutely, or? yes, mm -hmm. yes, I think it does. And part of it, I mean, there is there is a marketing element to this, is that, um, as I said, this is unique that Buffalo is doing this, and we want to get that word out there so that maybe when prospective students are thinking about which law school do I want to go to, a lot of them go into law school wanting to do public interest law work. They don't all want to get rich. Uh, a lot of them, they often find out that they have to get rich to pay off their student debts, but that's another issue. But um, yes, and so either the students are listening, maybe the pre-law advisors are listening and so on, so that, they will, so that we will get better known for the, the work that we're doing. Yes. There, was a, there was a question, I think, over here about outcomes. Someone asked about the outcomes. I think yes. from a university's perspective, having worked in one, it's really the think tank that you set up front right. was really that's the message that, you're, that, that this discussion is going on here. And yeah. This is seen as sort of a, a yeah. I advanced, mean, if, if advanced see, law if school. If we see some policy that's being discussed, discussed here eventually making its way into legislation or something like that, that's a major outcome. That's a major success. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, Sort of follow up to the comment. Uh, does anyone ever want a writing saying, you know, I won't be liable for this or that, or you won't publish this or that, or I have the right to cancel? Mm -hmm. What kind of issues come up? We, we, I don't do like written releases or anything like that. Uh, it hasn't been an issue so far. Um, again, like I said, since, since partly because they're, they tend to be faculty or comfortable with each other, they think of it as a conversation which we happen to be. Well, I mean, they know it's being broadcast, but it hasn't been an issue up, up, up to now. Anybody else? I've got one more. Yes. What What do you think was the biggest pitfall that you faced in getting this off the ground, and how did you address it? Um, the biggest pitfall or obstacle was simply was, was creating awareness. It was actually in many ways, very easy to do. So you notice the, uh, you really can't see it because of the, uh, the resolution here, but the, the, the hosting that we're using, for instance, is it's a website called classcaster.org, which is, so essentially it's free. But what actually, actually it's, a, uh, it's sponsored by a consortium of law schools that, that deal with law schools technology, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. Every law school in the U.S., and I think most Canadian law schools belong to it. You pay $5,000 a year, and you get all kinds of, of products and benefits, including unlimited use of their hosting service. So that's nice. You know, you're, you're limited to their, their, platform, their templates and things like that. But that makes it easy, that sort of thing. Um, and and uh, the technology was not really an issue. Uh, the main thing was simply making faculty aware of this idea and, and see the value of it. Yes? I, I think you mentioned this, but how much interest are you getting from other universities to be doing this thing? Well, I am sorry. We actually, this, this uh, I mentioned this class crits group the, uh, on, on law and economic inequality. We had a conference, and, and actually two of the podcast, two of the interviews came out of that conference that we had a few weeks ago. Uh, there are about 30 faculty from across the U.S. who came in for this. And several people have told me, oh, you need to come to my law school and show us how to do that. Yes. Yeah, so again, that was, that was part of, that's like the sixth move in the chess game, to get other law schools doing the same sort of thing. Yes. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm with Edison, and we're very interested in and the question I'd like to ask everybody uh, is, um, is there something that contributes to sort of accelerating or improving the uh, sustainability of these sorts of podcasts? Not, not, not only within sort of, as you say, within the like law school, but also reaching out to wider communities. Obviously, there's many people who may have great interest in these issues, but may not necessarily have the language or the social awareness or the accessibility. Yeah. So what do you reach out to? No, that, that is a big issue with, with any kind of, of, of uh, grassroots podcast, because you know, not everybody has the technology. And that one of the differences of this kind of work is that, although it would be nice if 
you know, the women in prison who are able to hear these podcasts, that's not the primary audience. We want to get people in policy making positions to be able to hear these, these ideas and these arguments. So for them, it's not, those, those barriers don't exist. Right. Are there any other barriers for that group? Well, just just sort of getting getting um, getting policymakers to listen to law professors. Yeah, <laughs> but again, that's something that that has. I've heard other. I heard my faculty express that issue that we should, we should be doing this. We should be providing you know information, say like reports to the you know New York Legislature on tax policy, and we should be giving them this information that we're producing all this empirical research and this high-level scholarship, we should be providing that information to them. So it's not just, you know, the, the usual interests that go in and have an influence on, on policy. It's kind of a little bit off topic, but do you see a movement in, let's say, your faculty to get the actual scholarly work out in the public more? So other oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Like um, expensive journal subscriptions and that sort of thing? Well, one thing is that law school journals are not expensive. They, at least in the U.S., and I think that this is true in Canada too, law school journals are generally published by the law schools, by student editors, and a typical subscription is maybe $45 a year. So it's not like other science disciplines and so on where you may be spending $25 for a one journal. Um, it's just, a, and the, the, the obstacle there is that they're hard to read. Right? Um, but again, our law school, our faculty, a dozen of our faculty have PhDs in other disciplines, you know, in addition to their law degrees, so, which means at least that they're 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 talking to other to other disciplines, not just law professors. They're also talking to historians and, and, and anthropologists, and sociologists. So that helps to some some extent. You know, still it's still technical, still scholarly, um, but and but many of them do publish, um, say, op-eds in the New York Times. And things like that. One of our professors, uh, Mikhail Matua, who does a lot of work in Kenya, he's from Africa, uh, does a lot of work on human rights in Africa, and he's written a number of op-eds in the New York Times. You know, um, the bigger issue there is the same issue that, that applies across higher education is that that stuff doesn't count towards tenure and things like that. But once they're tenured, you have all kinds of freedom to publish in all kinds of, of media. Anything else? Is anyone else doing anything? Like, any, does anyone, anyone we can talk to, anyone we can connect with, and spread and share this sort of work? Well, uh, Ni Ni Niagara College has experimented with podcasts and to actually teach a little bit. One of our one of our professors, Paul Dayball, gave us um, an internet uh, lecture over podcast, and me and my co-host. Steve over here from thisweekgeek.net, mm -hmm. we're thinking about approaching Niagara and maybe asking, hey, can we be TAs mm -hmm. to help teach podcasting? Oh, that would be great, yeah. yeah. And this was why we came to this lecture, and just, I've been listening to them the whole time, thinking, you know, I've got some really good ideas here. Yeah, well, that's a project I have, because I, I would love to do a course in podcasting for the students, or at least as, maybe as like an adjunct to, say, a clinical course, for people who are, uh, oh, one episode I have coming up, we had you know, this huge snowstorm in October, power went out for two weeks in most of the Buffalo area. Yeah. Um, so one of our law school clinics, the students who, who were doing our community economic development clinic, went out like a rapid response team to those affected neighborhoods and, and helped them fill out their FEMA forms and all that stuff to get to get things repaired and get back get their lives back together. That was our law school doing that. And and, and all law schools have clinics like that that are, that are doing real legal work in the community. And what I want to do with that is go and interview the professor who runs the clinic and the students who are doing that work and talk to them about what, what they did, what they learned, what, what, what their experience was working with people in, in, in emergencies. Yeah. Yes, for Steve. Uh, we currently, uh, I'm at Centennial College here in, in Toronto, and we currently uh, have a group of students producing uh, it's not up yet, but they've mm -hmm. now recorded the first two. And it basically pulls together some students from a couple of different programs, uh, throws an issue at them, mm -hmm. and they, they talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know one of the ones they just produced was, was basically coming out of uh, the uh, 
a wig out uh, YouTube video. Uh, so we've got advertising and public relations students talking about that. Uh, partly in connection with that is something that you mentioned earlier uh, that I have a question about is we've got some great videos and footage from guest speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, one is Donna Papacosta, who's on mm -hmm. the panel today. Uh, tedious stuff for somebody to sit through an hour of presentation. Right. But I'm wondering if there are some ways to repackage them, get all the, the greetings mm -hmm. and pleasantries uh, excised, uh, kind of a, a, a best of mm -hmm. as a podcast series. When you do have guests in, is there is there some sense in trying to? to we're we're doing up? some of that. I mean, obviously, the, that that requires a level of expertise that most law schools don't have on their staff. Um, although we're actually in the process of hiring an AV person for our uh, to do, and uh, anyone wants to apply for the job, we're, we're looking. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, for, well, for instance, we had one of our big event this past year was was when the Dalai Lama came to visit Buffalo and did an action. We did the first Law and Buddhism conference at at UB, and he was there for that morning, and then the conference went on for for an additional day and a half. And everything was filmed, and we're working with a documentarian who has done a lot, done a, a number of documentaries on Buddhism and things like that. And that's going to be part of this whole documentary she's been working on for a few years on Buddhism and social change and things like that. So, but that, that's a professional documentarian who's sort of working with us. Uh, yes. Yeah, I just want to mention that uh, the Toronto section of the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. Mm -hmm. Has started po uh, basically streaming and and podcasting, I guess, for lack of a better term, doesn't quite fit the mold right. of it. The meetings that occur. What we found actually is attendance has increased at the meetings, which mm -hmm. is something oh, yeah. that because uh, the first fear yeah. was no, 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 nobody will show yeah. up to the meeting. But what we found is uh, birds of a feather. <laughs> you know what I mean? Once they yeah. once people see what what the content is all about, they say, no, I got to start going out to these things. So they actually do work in in helping to build your community. I think that's a message. That yeah, and I didn't talk about streaming media or YouTube and things like that, but that all is a part of this. And let me just mention one other thing is that uh, this, this study group, research group that we have for this law and new media, again, I, we, we see that as a, a spectrum looking at the fact that digital media now brings the, you know, these production technologies to, to anyone. You know, what used to cost, you know, you used to have a $20,000 studio, you can now do on a MacBook, right? Um, so there's a whole spectrum from blogging and, and podcasting to documentary filmmaking and things like that, uh, full-length fe feature filmmaking. And that's what this projecting law group is about. And we're, we're sort of building up to maybe next year, maybe a year from now or so, we're going to have a conference. And again, this will be a cross-border conference. And so people who would be interested in that, please keep in touch with me. Yes. We're actually working here at Ryerson on uh, podcasting lectures uh, with the Comstock School and the RCC here. And we're working on a technology side where we're trying to figure out what would be the best way to streamline the process mm -hmm. of getting the lectures and all the different types of media that is used uh, by the lecturer and putting it out there, uh, either on you know, uh, a podcast or on the website as well. You know, sort of how the different things that students see and have everything like the, the whiteboard, the, the lecturer himself or herself, mm -hmm. you know, seeing how we distribute right. that whole workflow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're looking at some of those things too. There, there are some, some tools. Appresso is one, for instance, that lets you have a video of the speaker and the PowerPoint and the audio and all that on the screen. How do you spell that? Appresso, A P R E S O. Hi. Uh, I do my own podcast, it's nothing to do with anything that's actually uh, important in the world, but uh, I, I'm also a, a scientist at the Friends of, uh, Center of Friends of Sciences here yes. in Toronto, and uh, it's sort of like been stewing in my brain about getting the podcast up there done by Friends of Scientists mm -hmm. uh, and interviewing other Friends of Scientists, having a conversation on their topics, uh, because the mass populace and then those us by CSI. CSI effect, yes. Uh, yeah. We hear about that in law school. Yeah. You know, 
incredibly particular. Right. And uh, I've uh, gone into iTunes and I've searched for the present podcast. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think this is a, a nice stepping stone that I can use to pitch to our administration Sorry. Yes. Um, to develop something like this. So I'll be in contact with you. Okay. Uh, we're well over time. People are coming in with it. One last comment. Um, I know it's been about 35 minutes. We will do we we keep it between thirty minutes and and forty five minutes. That seems to be as much as right. Mine again. My mine ranges from thirty minutes to to an hour sometimes, depending on what I'm doing. Um, you know, in a particular episode. Yeah, I, I try. I've done a couple that went, ran over an hour, but I try not to do that. iPods do have pause buttons. You know, you can. You don't have to listen to it all at once. Are you familiar with Jen Simmons? She's big in the video blogging world. It's just that she, she's actually made quite a name for herself in the video blog community uh, for teaching. Uh, she teaches out of Temple University. I, I guess I don't even know honestly where that is. But um, but yeah, she she has a resources page, which is... Temple is important. She has a resources page on her site, which is all about tools for teachers who are trying to teach podcasting. It's pretty great. Oh, well, um, how do you spell yeah. her name? <laughs> what? Huh? Jen Simmons. Uh, it's just jensimmons.com. Actually, it's teaching.jensimmons.com for the resources page. And there's another site called Node 101, whether or not you've heard it. But that's an initiative by sort of some of the early video vloggers and video podcasters to help people set up nodes in their communities to teach other people how to podcast. I have a whole bunch of cards. If anyone would like to get in touch with me and talk about these projects, I would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.